everybody. We got a fun episode next. Um, James is going to name some names. Of course, we're going to talk about the last rising landmark. Uh, don't miss it. Check it out. とある田舎町で生まれて移り住んだ新宿で育ちこの町で大きたこれまでの俺たちの What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Yamato Damashi podcast. My name is James, joined by Ensign Inoue, of course, Hawaii strong, living in Japan. Ensign, how are you today? Good. Always good, man. Getting my sauna therapy and my uh, ice baths in every day, every morning, and every night. Yeah, I saw you upgraded the, the setup. You had the ice bath, and now you got the sauna. So. Yeah, now it's getting colder. So now, like this morning, the ice bath was at 0. 0.9. Oh. <laughs> it's brutal. What time in the morning are you doing it? Just so people know. About uh, nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. Okay. What time do you normally wake up? About seven or eight. And I do all my chores and stuff first. So that way yeah. I get a little sweaty. Yeah. You got free dogs. So. It's a lot of work. Yeah. I got a huge yard, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the koi, the go be fed. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 Cool. So today's episode, we are going to do names part three. If you guys haven't seen, we previously did names part one, names part two. Um, and today we have part three, thanks to one of our loyal uh, watchers, listeners uh, in Josh Gage, who gave us a cool little list a while back in the comments. So we're going to go through some of those names. And uh, But before we, we get there, I just wanted to uh, touch on Ryzen, because um, it happened a bit over a week ago now. And I just wanted to hear kind of... Um, your thoughts on you had obviously animal koji fighting you were caught in his corner um who was fighting igor tanabe and you also had Tsuyoshi, uh who had obviously a change of opponent but i just wanted to get your thoughts on the the event i thought it was a pretty good event man um we had we had a little change where we had to go to nagoya which is about five hours away so that kind of uh threw a little twist but we're already there for i was already going to go for animal koji so you know, it wasn't like I had to add the trip in. But then it did kind of complicate things where I had two fighters there now. And I had to make sure that they didn't have the fights too close together. So, yeah, uh, overall, um, you know, Animal, I think for Animal's fight, he, uh, Igor is just uh, another level. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Crazy. Igor would give uh, even a grappler problem. So our whole training was about uh staying off the ground <clears throat> we did uh, a lot of work on uh, if you're in this position on the ground this position but he was he was getting um caught left and right by my jiu-jitsu guys and we knew that oh man igor's probably a, a level above a lot of the guys that animal was sparring with at my gym so we knew that if he got to the ground it wouldn't be nice i i mean with that said i think he did pretty well i mean he got taken down he got mounted he survived the mount yeah. He actually got on top, and if he postured up right away, it would have been a real interesting fight. But, you know, he, he did that basic mistake where he didn't posture up, so Igor climbed his legs up and got the triangle in. So it was one of those things that, yeah, he just – he was a better striker than Igor. Igor is a much better grappler than him, and uh, he, Igor just brought it into his element. Yeah, I think because people because he's a, got his kickboxing background, right, people were quite surprised that – how long he lasted for um because it wasn't like a straight away submission he managed to hold him off for a little bit but like you say igor tanabe is just a hell of a grappler um do you think um animal koji will get another shot in ryzen hopefully yes he will i already made that I, I talked to uh the matchmaker of rising and told him that yes he we need to he needs another shot and they said yep they're going to give him another shot so he'll be back into rising for sure 100 percent awesome that's good. That's good to see. I'm excited. Hopefully a bit more of a level playing field, right? You know? Well, I told the matchmaker, man, if you want an exciting fight, get him a striker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The animal's right. the type of guy that wants to throw down at people, and he's tough. So yeah. if he gets a good striker, man, it, it'll be a real exciting fight, win or lose. Yeah. Because it's what? Welterweight <laughs> pretty much, isn't it? 170? 
Yeah. It's about that, isn't it, right? So he wants to move up in weight though. He wants to like fight light heavy. He wants to put on more weight, but really. Um I don't think he realizes how hard it is to put on quality weight. You can't I mean, if you're not gonna do yeah. steroids and your hormones, you know, you're not gonna be getting that much weight, you know. When I try to pick up weight for my fighting, I think I got like three to four pounds a year, man. That's the most muscle weight I could get on. He should go the other way because Ryzen's got a lot of good strikers in 155, right? You think like yeah, Luis yeah, Gustavo, um, who else is there? Uh, Johnny Case. Um, you know, lots of, lots of good guys there that would have some exciting fights with him. Whereas 170 is, there's not much of a division, so... Yeah, yeah. You need to get in that sauna. <laughs> Start cutting some weight. Um, and then obviously Siyoshi, last minute opponent change. But for me, from what I saw, I thought he looked super patient, picked his shots, footwork looked good. I was super impressed with the leg kicks. The leg kicks look really nice the way he just ripped apart the yeah, legs. But what, what, yeah, what was your assessment of the fight? Well, I thought, I thought he was a, he was too careful. I wanted him to step in more. I wanted him to take more chances. But I guess he, uh, you know, he was more content on uh, just getting the W, which is which is good too. But I mean, for me, I I, I think a fighter needs to push uh, push the risks and take chances. But I guess you know this this guy he felt that this Korean guy was a smaller guy. Last minute replacement, um, didn't have a name, so he had so much to lose. Yeah, in the fight, so you know, I mean, in the I could see after the first round, after Shioshi would kick him or something, the guy would freeze up. So I was telling Shioshi, you know, after uh, after you, you know, a jab, a nice jab or a kick, I mean, come in with a couple more strikes and with more combinations because he's not ready for that. And Shioshi was hitting him to a point where this guy wasn't a heavyweight, so when he felt Shioshi's punches. He was getting rocked by it. So I kind of wanted Sushi to step in more in the second round, but he just wouldn't pull the trigger. And he, he kind of told me after the fight that he didn't want to take any chances. So, you know, I mean, you'd be a fighter that be, re, you know, be getting the victories, which is cool, which is good. But um, you got to take risks to be remembered in the fighting world to make a legacy. I be yeah, that's, yeah, you're right. You're right. The taking risks is what the fans like to see, right? Um, especially Japanese fans, you know, because even if he took a risk and he lost, I think Japanese fans are way more respectful in that in that sense. Yeah, I guess I guess in a way this was a fight that he couldn't lose. If he lost this, it would you know, he's one he's trying to um shoot for a heavyweight title, you know, have have Rising put a heavyweight Grand Prix tournament on or give him a fighter that they can fight for a title match. So I guess that's really big on his mind. And I think if he gets the title, his fight money doubles. So, you know, financial incentive. And, you know, like like I said today, the, the sports athlete wants to make money to raise his family. And that's probably his priority is to win the fight so he can possibly get that title shot. How likely do you think a heavyweight Grand Prix is? Uh... Um, yeah, um, I... I think it's a. I think it's the best idea. Sure, she doesn't want to do it, but I think it's a good idea. But I don't know. I think Sak. I, when I talk to Sakaki about it, seems he's he's he thinks it's an idea, but he just doesn't see it happening. I guess you know, for him, they gotta they gotta call a whole bunch of heavyweights. I mean, yeah. Um, and tournaments aren't easy to run. You know, when you gotta try to do a one day tournament, you know, there's so much complications in that and injuries yeah. and pullouts and you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it'd be cool. I hope there is a championship. I don't know. It's just about finding the competitors, right? Like who who you can go up against. I mean, yeah, I've said did, it. He did mention um. He did mention that uh, Kyokushin guy. Which one? Mikio Mikio Ueda. Ueda. Yeah, he well, did mention him, and then you know, I mean, Ueda so and Shosh train together, and mm. um, I just don't think. Uh, Miki Oueda has actually created enough of a name to be a yeah. legitimate um, title contender. Yeah. Uh, boy, is he like one and one now, right? Because he lost the TK. And yeah. then he did fight someone else, and I think he won, didn't he? But yes, he's, yes. I would say Shoshi's way higher in the ranks than uh, Ueda well, at I mean, the moment. 
to be honest, I I do think that she, it's a little early for Shoshi too. Mm. That's why you know a, a a Grand Prix would be actually the most interesting thing, mm. because you know you I mean, Shoshi has only been fighting for three years and he's gone like a you know, up and down route where he won one one lose one one lose you know one win you know so um, it's the it, the inc- inconsistency I believe wouldn't grant a title match but. I mean, he, he's Rising's best heavyweight. So if they're and and I think they do want to create a heavyweight champion and heavyweight belt. So that's probably why uh, it's in the talks right now. Interesting. I know. I personally, I want to see uh, him fight maybe a Vadum or maybe a Junior dos Santos. You know, one of those guys where they've got a lot that of history. Be, that would be good for Shoshi's name and it'd be a good title fight. But can Rising afford that? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. They still, I mean, they they might be worth the paycheck. They still pull lots of views on YouTube. Their fight recently. I think, I, I think so too. I it's think they cool. are. It'd be cool to see how Siyoshi's skills stand up against them as well. Right. So. Yeah. That's like legit, legit heavyweights. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get into some of these names then. Um, All right. So the first one on his list. So he's put a lot of old school Japanese guys. Which I'm cool. It's cool to see some from Pride, some from Shooter, some from Rings. You know all about. So let's um, let's see if you've got any uh, opinions on some of these guys. So the first one on his list is Kotetsu Boku, who is the fighter. Oh, Kotetsu. Yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to mind with Boku is uh, awesome striker. Awesome striker. Yeah. Super nice guy. And the funny thing about Boku is when we had that big fight with uh, when Kid uh, started uh, like ignoring the referee and striking Katsuda, the guy I shoved off the ring so happened to be Boku. Oh, really? There was a riot <laughs> and uh, some of the, the case factory guys were trying to get in the ring and I shoved some guys off the ring and I actually have it on my Japanese YouTube where I talk to Boku and I, I you know, just who, how many, how many years later I realized it was Boku. I didn't even know it was Boku. I was just shoving guys off the ring. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. That's funny actually because in his comment he did put like maybe these, some of these will be shots fired, but obviously that's what a beef that, you know, you guys are fine. Um, next up, Sane Kikuta, um, who fought in Pride and I believe he also fought Egan a long time ago. Yeah, Kikuta, boring fighter. Yeah, that's my memory. very, very, very good defensively, but um, not much of an offense. He was someone that was hard to beat and hard to submit, but uh, very um, non-aggressive. Very, very boring fighter. And you know the, the the other thing that stands out with Kikuta is he's like a she's like a girl. Really? Well, you know, this might be a bad classification, but. Um, not a girl, but a role. He he he's real nitty gritty about what's written about him, how his pictures look. He's the type of guy to take a picture and you have to check what his picture looks like. I wow. did an interview with him for a magazine, and for me, you know, a lot of times when I get the magazine, I don't really check the articles. I kind of whatever I say goes. But he, the 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 guy who the writer actually contacted me and asked me about it. And I said, oh, I'm fine. Do it. Print whatever you wrote. And he goes, oh, my God, I wish Kikuta was like you. Kikuta went back like four or five times telling him, you got to take this out. You got to take that out. Change that word. Change that word. Yeah. So wow. right where I heard that, I was like, oh, what a bitch. You know, so yeah. that's, that's the first thing that comes yeah. out of my, my mind when I hear Kikuta. What a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. The first shot's fired, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> shot's fired. <laughs> okay. Uh, another pride name. Uh, I'm gonna have to try and pronounce this Yoshihisa Yamamoto, who Pride and Rings guy. Now, I'll tell you, my mem- the first thing that comes to my mind was his fight with Mark Kerr, right? Where uh, he beat Mark Kerr technically because Mark Kerr knocked himself out when he do you remember he slams him and then Mark Kerr, like, oh, was it got, him? Like, yeah, that was Yamamoto. Oh, damn, I don't know what, what comes to mind for me is Hicks and Gracie, right. That he actually fought a good fight with Higgs and Grace. You know, mm. for me, the first um, 
he was a big star in rings. And the first interaction mm-hmm. I had with him was he, uh, when Egan fought in rings and he, Egan got disqualified with Naruse. Um, Yamamoto was one of the guys that came, was trying to go after Egan in the ring. And again, like I always, I'm like the pit bull guarding the ring. Nobody comes in. He was one of those guys that I kind of shoved. Really? Wow. Yes. If you go on YouTube and you go Google Egan Naruse and go rings, the aftermath, you can, you see the aftermath. You can see me, uh, I'm, I'm right there in the ring and I'm, sh- I'm grabbing, like kind of like shoving, uh, him in the chest saying, uh, kind of telling him, hey, stay out, bro. Don't, don't get involved. I can see he's picked some names to uh, <laughs> really the way there's been some controversy. He probably knew about that. Yeah, he's picked some good ones. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as a fighter, he's a tough kid. Uh, mm. I thought he did really well with Hickson. And he was, you know, he was one of those pro wrestlers I was willing to get in the ring and, uh, you know, fighting Mark Kerr. Jesus Christ, you know, he's not yeah. picking his fight. So, you know, tough guy. Respect to him. I think it was Mark Kerr's return fight as well. It was when he'd been a- away for quite a bit and then he was first coming back. It was after your fight, for sure. Um, uh-huh. The next one is, is his pro wrestling name was Kendo Kashin, um, also known as Tokimitsu Ishizawa. Um, yeah, I, I know him personally. Good guy. A uh, good fighter. I mean, he did well with Hein Gracie. So, you know, good fighter, hmm. good guy, pretty humble. Nothing bad to say about Kendo. Okay. Cool. Koji Oishi from Pancras last one. Yeah, I know Koji Oishi. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, I knew him from back in the day in the wrestling days. He used to wrestle for Aoyama Gakuen. And for my Randy Couture fight, I went and trained at Aoyama Gakuen. So he has a wrestling wrestling background, Koichi. Uh, Oishi. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, he's a uh, um, super tough fighter. Uh, scrappy and could take a beating. But uh, not a fighter that actually um, was able to create a legacy or win any big titles. Yeah, le- less unknown to fans, I think. It's a good one. Yoshihiro Akiyama, sexy Yama himself. Akiyama. Um, mm-hmm. The first thing that comes to my Akiyama is uh, he was known for cheating in judo with the Vaseline on his gi. And then Sakuraba's not the kind of guy that would complain about anything, but Sakuraba was complaining about grease on him. Yeah. But other than that, uh, as far as fighting, he came from a judo background and was an amazing striker, super athlete. And uh, he's, uh, I think he resides, he resides in Hawaii now with his daughter. Really? And um, yeah, he loves, uh, he loves Power Stones. I actually made him a bracelet. And it's, it's cool because uh, every time I see him in Japan, he comes and says hi. I say hi to him. You know, we got a lot of respect for each other. So, you know, besides that, um, the allegedly cheating in judo and in pride. Yeah. Super nice guy, super athlete. Super good yeah. fighter. I mean, I remember he had that he had that spinning back kick, super good. I mean, you're talking about a judo guy that had like yeah. amazing, shit. yeah. And he beat Aoki, yeah, 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 recently, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bit, a bit of a weight difference there, but he uh, he was yeah. on that Netflix show as well. Like, did you see that physical 100? He was like, I did, a... and I was amazed at how freaking popular he is. And he's like mm-hmm. a super superstar in Korea, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, when he came out, I, I saw all those like Olympic athletes, famous people, mm-hmm. like in all with him. It's like whoa, and then I mean, they had his—they calling him by his Korean name, but it wasn't like oh, Ak- yeah. like it was Akiyam. Oh my God, they're like they're like in in his presence, all in all, just being in his presence. So that was kind of like a real um, wake up call for me. Like, oh, he's he's a lot bigger than I even imagined in Korea. Yeah, no, yeah, I think he's super famous <clears throat> over there. Um, Masanori Suda, who was a shooter guy who fought Egan as well, I believe. Yeah, I think he did. He beat Egan. He beat Egan. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Um, Suda, um, solid. Uh, any any shooter champion is solid with everything: striking, grappling, uh, takedowns, and overall, super humble guy, super nice guy. Nice. Okay, well, here's one you'll definitely know. Yoji Anjo. 
Wow, Yoji Ando, yeah. Um, super funny guy, super humorous, tough competitor. Um, and he, uh, I remember sparring with him. He was a super hard guy to submit. Oh, really? Wow. And tough, tough as nails. But uh, um, from what I understand, too, when he went to Challenge Hickson, it wasn't his thing. The the Pro Wrestling Association asked him to do that. It was like part of his, he had to, he was told to do that. And, you know, um, I do want to get him on uh, our our page one day to talk about it. Yeah, on yeah. Our, we need to up. I don't think he's ever talked about it yet. So we need that. Would be, <laughs> would be good to get him on. Yeah, and talk about that whole thing when he went down to challenge Hickson. Yeah, the history books need it, right? We need, <laughs> we need the other side of the story. Yeah. Um, and then I added this one as well. Hiromotsu, Hirom, Hiromitsu Kanehara. Oh, yeah. That's still a friend today. He's he's the chiropractor now. Yeah. Super good chiropractor. I mean, every injury I go in with, he goes, oh, yeah, I had that before. Oh, I, <laughs> Sarah has an injury. Yep, I had that before. He's had every injury that you can even think of. Um, wow. And I think he was one of the. I thought he was one of the best fighters there is in in Pride. I mean, he uh, his striking, his ground. He he was tough as nails. You know, his fight with Vanderlei yeah. was amazing. Yeah, the Vanderlei fight. Yeah, right. he, he just didn't have that charisma, or or I don't know if it was he didn't have the looks or charisma to. Yeah. Be subtle. But, I mean, he was definitely as far as level wise and ability, man. He was one of the top fighters. I I thought he should have been. Um, Promoted a lot more. Did he fight Krokop? I think he did, didn't he? And he, he fought, he fought everybody. Krokop he fought, he everybody. Fought, uh, yeah, he fought even in rings. When he fought in rings, he fought everybody in rings. Henderson, Dan Henderson, he fought everybody. He, yeah, he did. Yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at his record now. Wow. Yeah, he did fight everyone. There's a who's who. Um, okay, so, so he also gave some other classic names, um, but this time from the U.S., uh tank abbott wow tank abbott i mean i remember seeing him fight um he was a uh, i think he was um part of t ortiz's team in the beginning pretty much just a guy that never trained and just came off the streets tough as nails and i mean he's one of those guys that when he turns even when he turns 80 he probably still can scrap you know <laughs> tank oh, abbott it was a what a what a um a, I, I feel he's a pioneer of mma He's one of those guys that, before the sport, sport was even understood, he he was willing to step in and, um, you know, throw down. So a lot of respect to Tank Abbott. Yeah, he definitely had balls. I did used yeah. to cringe at his commentary though. His commentary was like, <laughs> you probably know, like he he would just be like shitting on the fighters, and he'd be like, I could knock out that guy. And like, <laughs> it was before, it's before the age of like a pro professional fighter commentary i guess it was kind of uh, tank abbott just like as if he's in a bar sort of thing so um uh, another pioneer from the streets marco huas wow yeah that's one of the classic um uh i think he was a luto livery guy mm. and he was uh they, they used to call him the king of the streets i remember he had so much respect in the from the jiu-jitsu people because he was one of the toughest uh, luto livery guys him and Ugo Duarte. And I remember seeing him fight Alexander Utska, and Alexander Utska beat him. I couldn't believe that. I thought Alexander Utska coming from pro wrestling was going to get his ass kicked, but he actually beat Huas. I mean, whew. but yeah, I don't know. Marcos Huas, um, freaking pioneer of MMA, man. And uh, another Brazilian in Hugo Duarte. Oh, Hugo Dorte. Yeah, that's that's actually the guy who um I mean he was uh one of the only guys that really took Hickson on straight head on head. He actually had Hickson in the mount in the beginning of that beach fight. And Hickson uh, was able to escape and, and mount him and then beat him up to a tour he got really bloody before they broke it up. But so he was one of those um one of those guys that wasn't afraid of Hickson Gracie. And for me, he when he fought Mark Kerr. Knowing how how uh you know what a beast Ugo Duarte was when he fought Mark Kerr is the fight that made me want to fight Mark Kerr. Like it's because um I think Ugo Duarte eventually got disqualified because he was trying to run out of the ring. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, but Ugo Duarte is like one of those 
beast, one of those monsters that was willing to fight Hickson. And you're thinking about him, you know, turning to like a coward and trying to run out of the ring. I'm like, oh my God, that ferocity that Mark Kerr has must be amazing to feel. So that's what made me want to fight Mark Kerr. Yeah. Yeah, we talked a bit about that in uh, one of the previous episodes we did uh, about um, Pride. So check that out. Uh, Dan Seven. Dan Severin, my whole, you know, of course, he's an amazing competitor. But I remember going to a um, MMA expo in Syracuse, New York. And he was there. And, man, I was surprised at how this guy was all about business. You know, we got um, the promoter gave us, like, hundreds of um, pictures for us to sign. And, you know, these, these fans are paying to get in the expo. And I was kind of like, oh, I just... I'll just sign them and give them out. And Dan Severn was like straight up. Nope. You pay me $10 or so you got getting a signature. Everything you did with Dan, you had to pay. And I, I, I could tell that he was like a, like a real strict businessman. He was all business. I mean, he's not just a good fighter. He was really like a, a, a businessman. For me, totally not my style. I, I'd rather um, show my appreciation to the fans and give them autographs for free. But I mean, Dan Severn is Dan Severn. You know, he he was one of those uh, one of the first uh, ultimate UFC fighter winners, yeah, champions, ultimate champions. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I mean, he, he has every right to demand money for his pictures, but. Not my style, but it just made me see him as like a huge, um, like a real strict businessman. Yeah, you always had that crazy questionable record as well, right? Like uh, there's a few funny stories about him. I remember I listened to a podcast that you've been on, um, the Lights Out podcast, Chris Light was podcast. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And they, they covered his career and, and I was kind of shocked to hear some of the stuff that they were saying. It's pretty w- worth a oh, listen. Really? I yeah, it's just kind it. of about throwing fights and uh, weird associations. And... He's a pro wrestler. You know, he's more of a pro wrestler than a fighter. Tough yeah. as nails, but yeah, he, I could see him like being yeah. a politician. His record's like over 300 fights or something crazy like that. Um, he used to fight every weekend. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> the way he fought, yeah. Uh, Keith Hackney. Wow, Keith Hackney, he was a he was a ferocious beast. Yeah. <laughs> no ground, but he was like he was there out to try and kill you. Like you could tell Keith was there to to hurt people. And I, I used to love watching Keith Hackney. Yeah. That whole era of UFC is so fun, right? When you watch like the early UFCs, it feels so different to anything now these days. It feels like vintage, I don't know, footage. It's just completely it's, it's a sport now. It wasn't a sport back then. You could yeah. tell it just wasn't a sport. It's so fun to watch. Though. I, I really, people that haven't seen it need to go back and watch like UFC 1 to maybe 15, like something about, you know, around that sort of time. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's, a, it's a trip. It's such an awesome, awesome watch. Um, Dave Manet. Oh, Dave Manet, great wrestler, man. Tough. Tough, but I, I always felt that Dave was never really became like a MMA fighter. Mm. He was more like a wrestler that was fighting MMA. Um, forget I heard. I know he's a really good wrestler, tough as nails. But uh, one of those guys that just um, couldn't complete the whole uh, mixed martial artist. You know what he had to do to become a true mixed martial artist. And here's a name that always uh, splits people: Tito Ortiz. Tito, yeah. I mean, he was uh, the alternate that took my place in UFC 13 when I got injured. And um, Tito, uh, you know, he, and he Huntington, bad, bad boy. He went into politics. I've always had a good relationship with Tito. Um, I always uh, looked up to him. He was always a good, good guy to me. Um, in fact, there's a funny story where I went to a fight in, uh, in Washington Washington State, and I was there because the promoter was one of my friends, Leonard Leonard uh, Gabriel. He was promoting it, and Tito was one of the special guests there. 
And it was so funny because uh, no one recognized me and everyone was going out for Tito's autograph. And I, you know, I'm, I'm cool with that. You know, Tito's a big name. He was huge in the UFC. He, he did a lot for MMA. He was one of those guys that him and Chuck Liddell actually created what the UFC is today. And he got into the ring and when he made a speech, he, he called, he, he went and told everyone, I don't know if you guys don't know, but there's this guy that I really look up to. And, uh, one of the pioneers of the sport in Sydney night, he kind of pointed me out to everybody. Yeah, it was, and I was kind of taken aback by it. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. He, he really looked up to me and he, he acknowledged me. It was pretty cool. I read his book too. I loved his book. Yeah. He gets such a bad rap, right? And I think, you know, politically people can, um, you know, it brings out sometimes those sorts of conversations. You People associate all the politics with the person, but actually, you know, Tito did a lot of stuff for communities, a lot of charity work. He um, He's the first person that I got into with MMA. I remember seeing him thinking, who's this guy with bleach blonde hair? You know, he was the first fighter I think I ever made me go, okay, I'm going to watch this UFC thing just because I want to see oh, what this guy's about. And probably a lot of fans. We should actually yeah. try to get him on the yes. I would like to talk to him because uh, there's been, I think the last couple of years, people have really kind of shat on him a little bit. Um, just because of some of the stuff that's happened politically, and it would be good to just hear from him, hear what he's doing, and then you know, you know what too, yeah. Knowing Tito Ortiz is, he gets he gets ripped on a lot, but he, if anything, I know Tito, he he probably don't give a shit. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't. It, he doesn't lose a single second of sleep over that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, we should get more. It could be an interesting conversation. Let's see. I'll try, I'll try to reach out to him to shoot him a message. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna try and not not say anything bad about this guy, but from a fan point of view, not the funnest of fights. Matt Lindlin. <laughs> Matt Lindlin. The only thing I can remember of Matt Lindlin is when he fought Phil Baroni. Oh, really? And I thought it was real classless the way he kept. Um, he like you know, I, I mean, yeah, he he did the right game because Phil was really mentally uh, like a, a head case that just would blow, get so pissed off when you take take him out of out of his game, mm-hmm. and he overly to a point where he was bad mouthing, talking shit to Phil during the weigh-ins. It got so bad that I actually turned around to Matt and told him, you know what, it's enough already, man. Really. Wow. And, you know, it, it didn't stop, of course, but you know, I I got to a point where I wanted to say something to him and say, "Fuck, that's enough, man! Stop it already," because it was real. Um, to a point where, um, you know, back in that day, there was really not much shit, shit talking like today. Today, yeah. compared to today, it's kind of average. It would be kind of average, but back in that day, that was unheard of, and I yeah. just felt it was super unnecessary and super bad sportsmanship. So that's my. You know, he's a, he, uh, that's my whole thought of Matt Lennon when I hear his name. Yeah, I always hated his fighting style. It would be so boring. And uh, it was a rumor that he used to, like, not shower because it would make it, you know, not shower for a couple of days because it would make it that much horrible for his opponents when he would be, like, grinding on them and have, like, oh, using his game. I don't that's know if it's true or not, but, but that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not good hygiene. Um, another controversial name, Mayhem Miller. Oh, God. I know him personally, super nice guy, but that's before he lost some screws. I mean, I, I don't know if he, you know, he's such a, he's such a screwball that I can see him, you know, don't not, yeah, he probably doesn't give a shit, but. I could even wouldn't even put it by him that he's doing all this shit on purpose because he don't give a fuck, <laughs> or he's lost a couple screws, man. But Mayhem Miller was always that guy that was um, didn't really give a fuck. Yeah, you remember he had his own MTV show as well, Bully Beatdown. Yeah, I, I used to actually like that, the Bully Beatdown, until I heard mm-hmm. it was all set up. Oh, was it? Wow. Yeah, it's all set up, so it's kind of disappointing. That was, uh, I was like, ah, shit. I stopped watching it after that. I used to watch every one. I thought it was pretty cool. But after I found out it was all set up, it was like, ah, then you could tell 
watching it like, ah, oh, shit, yeah, they are acting, you know. So it's it kind of a letdown. I heard he just got arrested again, yeah. Yeah, I think he's in some yeah. sort of trouble again or something. I haven't followed I just, it too much. I just wish he could, you know, outgrow that and you know get his it's head not. back on straight and you know be the person that I I used to know. Yeah, yeah, he has a really memorable career in Japan, right? Like he was, I remember. Well, it, it, Really big in Hawaii in the yeah, Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah I remember. Big... Yeah, my yeah, because I haven't seen much of Super Bowl, but I I watched a lot of Dream, and I remember him in Dream, and he was, you know, one of the key middleweights there. So he's a good grappler. Yeah, yeah, and he he even did like Ultimate Fighter as well. He was a big deal, wasn't he? he made... Speaking of big, Ron Waterman. Oh I, ah, shit! He was in like the first UFCs. Yeah, real tough. Bald headed, uh, strong guy. I remember I from Pride, he was huge. The big, he was the big guy. It looked like he'd taken a lot of steroids. I can't remember if he fought he in the was, UFC. Maybe he, he did. did. He did, or did he fight the rings too? Look, I remember he was like the H2O man, Ron Waterman. Here we go. Look at his MMA record. I don't remember much of his Oh, he did. Yeah, though. you're right. Yeah, UFC 20, 21, 22. Yeah, I think he was in the UFC. I think he also went to rings for a little bit. Yeah, Pancras, Pride, <laughs> WC. Yeah, he went he fought did, in a lot of different places. Who did, who did he fight in Pride? He fought in Pride. Oh, Overeem's brother, Valentine Overeem. I remember that. That was crazy. I don't even remember. I don't... I don't even remember that. Who else have we got? Uh, I mentioned this podcast earlier. Chris Lytle. Tough as nails. I liked him. He was a good fighter. Tough fighter, man. Mm-hmm. And real humble guy, man. When I was went on his podcast, I, I I knew it was a Chris Lytle podcast, but I, I until the like the first beginning, I was like, holy shit, that's Chris Lytle. <laughs> He was such a nice guy, and then you know, like a normal dude. I, I didn't realize I was like, who that that he was he's a scrapper, that's why I'm like, wow, Chris Lytle, super cool guy. Yeah, he always had entertaining fights, right? And um, didn't I always remember was, the commentary team always used to say, like, oh, he was a firefighter as well, right? Didn't he, he keep a job as well while he was fighting? I think so. I think back all the fighters back in that day used to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> True, right? Uh Frank Mir. Wow, um, phew, the, the the thing that comes to mind is when he broke Tim Sylvia's arm in the UFC. Mm-hmm. I mean, he snapped the, this part of the forearm. It's freaking yeah. unreal. Man. And I saw him in Vegas when he fought in the um, Sakuraba's, uh, what is that grappling thing Sakuraba does? Oh, Quintet. Quintet. Mm-hmm. And he actually, I was kind of surprised because he actually called out to me to come say hi. So yeah, Frank Mir, one of the one of the old school. Um, I think he was the UFC champion, yeah, for a bit. Yeah, he was. Yeah, a, re- a really young age as well, right? Amazing submission, and amazing submissions. Had those big fights with Brock Lesnar. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Really good mind for the sport as well. I always felt like he was a good commentator and really knew his like, you know, he knew his people, knew his stuff. So his daughter's doing good now, huh? Oh, really? His daughter's a yeah. fighter as well. She's a fighter, yep. Cool to see the next gen. Uh, Andre Olowski. Andre Olowski was a beast, but I just I was uh, surprised that his, he had a glass jaw. Yeah. Yeah, that was the only thing. Like, wow, what a waste. He has a glass jaw, but he, I, he hit like a beast, man. Everyone remembers that fatal knockout, right? Where... <laughs> Uh, I thought he was beating Fedor too. He was actually he was putting it on Fedor like Fedor's never had before until boom, one shot, boom, that's all over. <laughs> he did a crazy job of turning his career back around then because there was a point where everyone thought he was going to retire, right? And now he yeah. is he still in the UFC now? I mean, he fought pretty recently, I think. Um, fight for a while. I think maybe a year ago, two years ago, he fought. Um, but they, it's hard because they kept putting him on the prelims. I'd be like, why is Andre Oloski on the prelims? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, he's I, still I like when he first 
scene when his hair was different, yeah? And the beard yeah, and yeah. everything. I the thought that more looked, looked more Russian, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Kimbo Slice. Oh, wow. Um, amazing, yeah. Street fighter. Actually made a career of it. Straightened up his life. And um, unfortunately, gone too soon, man. Yeah, it was a... A really crazy time in MMA, right? Where everybody knew the name of Kimbo Slice. And yet, probably most modern MMA fans probably don't even know about that era of fighting where, like, Kimbo Slice was so huge. Well, Masvidal came out from that, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true, actually. Mas- at least Masvidal got to kind of carry on that name a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. The Snowman, Jeff Monson. Ooh, Jeff, I heard Jeff Bunsen. Um, I, I thought he was a little bit of a boring fighter too, but great wrestling, great grappling. Um, I hear he's in Russia now. He lives in Russia. He lives in Russia, right? I heard that as well. Yeah, and I also heard that he made. Um, he kind of opened my eyes because he made a comment. He made a post about, you know, how everyone's saying, you know, poor Ukraine, poor Ukraine, like that. But he was saying something about. Ukraine used to bomb a city in Russia before this whole thing went went to into a war, and he said since Russia's been attacking Ukraine, that city has had not no bombings anymore. Wow. Okay. So apparently, yeah. it's not um, it's not as uh, one sided as you see it. Where poor Ukraine, you know, I don't know. It's it seems like there's a uh, there's a lot of backstory to that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either, but there's always two sides to every story. Uh, Frank Trigg. Frank Trigg, oh. I thought Frank Trigg uh, should have beat GSP, man. He got so close. Oh, wait. No, it was Matt Hughes. Matt Hughes, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, he actually was beating up Matt Hughes and just got caught. Frank Trigg. I believe he's one of the one of the best mixed martial art fighters that was there in in our time, and he yeah. never really got to do what he actually can do. I mean, yeah, Frank Triggs amazing. He, I mean, amazing wrestler, tough as nails, and he loves my bracelets. Oh, really? <laughs> Great ref as well, right? I think he's a really good ref. Oh, he is. He's a good ref. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I just got a message from him the other day. He's uh, some of his his bracelets broke, so. Um, he's sending them back to me to get restrung. Nice, yeah, yeah. No, Frank, Frank's done it all. But yeah, at one point you're right though. He was like the other than Matt Hughes, easily like the best world away in the world, right? And oh, then they yeah, actually oh, yeah. fought. Yeah, so he's and he was really big in Shooto as well, wasn't he? He had a lot of fights in Shooto, I think. Yeah, he, I think he also fought. Um, Ma, uh, Ma, oh wait, who did he fight? He fought Sakura, yeah, Maha. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you he want beat, some funny Sakurai, yeah, I was oh, gonna no, say, he lost Sakurai. yeah, I think he got knocked out with a knee. Yeah, the volley, two, yeah, volley two. But if anyone wants some funny Sakurai stories, then look out for shots part two because we did, we went in on that. It was a, a good time. Um. Gilbert Ivel. Bad boy, bad boy. Didn't know what the rules were. He but he did buy a, a purebred gi when he was training jiu-jitsu. So <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, he was a, a controversial figure to say the least, right? In terms of how he treated the rules. So speaking of enforcing the rules, Herb Dean. I'm good ref. That's about all I got to say about her Dean. Good ref. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the referees always get a bad rap. I mean, yeah, you got to make. Sometimes you got to make a call that's going to piss somebody off. But I, I feel Herb Dean's a good ref. And the thing is, right, a good ref just doesn't really get praise. Like, if you're a good ref, you don't talk about the ref, right? Like, whereas a bad ref, you're going to talk about the bad ref. So, but yeah, I yeah. think he's a good ref too. <clears throat> um, one name, a new, uh, more modern name, Paddy Pimlet. Uh, 
don't like the guy, piece of shit. Mm. I think he talks too much, and I don't think he's he he's not he's not even he hasn't he hasn't proved himself yet to be able to talk with like he's talking. So even you know I mean it's it's it'll be an interesting match with uh, Ferguson. Looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I, I believe. I mean, Ferguson's been losing, but I still think he's Ferguson still can fight. So I believe my prediction is Ferguson's going to beat the shit out of him. I hope it happens. I think that too. And it's funny because online you keep seeing people saying like how Pimlet's on like on a win streak and Ferguson's obviously lost like the last three or four fights. Um, but yeah, it's Tony Ferguson, man. It's like. I can see him beating Paddy Pimmel. Ferguson still can scrap, man. I mean, yeah. I think people are, I mean, I could be mistaken, but I think mm-hmm. people are too much on this um, Paddy Pimmel hype train. He, he just talks a lot. He sells his he sells his shit with his mouth and not with his hands and his ability, I, I don't think. I just don't think he's as good as he thinks he is yet. I agree. I agree. Uh, Tim Sylvia. Tim Sylvia, wow! Um, the first thing I think of is when he, Frank Mir broke his arm, and and it, uh, unfortunately, I hear he's still having problems with that arm. And yeah, of course, you know UFC doesn't cover any of those injuries anymore because it's too long ago. But apparently, he's still having to pay for repet- repetitive surgeries on that arm, which is unfortunate. I feel that. Um, I wish the UFC would take care of all the pioneers, you know, guys like Mark Coleman, you know, Mark Kerr, you know, Tim Sylvia is one of them. You know, I wish they would, um, you know, really respect and take care of the guys that actually made the sport what it is today. Yeah, I agree. Um, Another heavyweight from that sort of era, Rico Rodriguez. Rico, um, whew, good guy. I mean, I, I actually got offered to fight him in a grappling match. Really? Wow. Yeah, would have been, which is would be interesting. His, I, I think he's super good though. He was really good. Super aggressive, good, great, great grappling. Um, for a big boy, good stamina. Yeah, I, I, I also feel that Rico actually should have done a lot more than he did. I thought Rico was really good, and I was surprised that he didn't get, um. More publicity and and more chances to show his ability. I, th- I think Rico was someone that didn't get credit where it's due. Yeah, especially in America. I think he he did quite a lot of pro wrestling in, in Japan as well, didn't he? With Mark Coleman, I remember they did the the New Japan yeah, pro wrestling. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Hector Lombard. Oh, Hector! What a power! The first thing I think of Hector is just. Unreal athlete, unreal explosiveness, and a, he's a super genius, man. Do you know he he invents shit and he's he's invented like the champ raps. Oh, he's invented he told me this. this. Yeah. He showed me this thing when he came to Hawaii. He showed me this thing that he invented this thing where you can pour protein without spilling the protein around. That's cool. I'm, I'm, I I thought he I, he said he was gonna patent it and and, and bring it out. But I think it might, he might have already. But yeah, he he's like a he's super intelligent. One of the most feared fighters as well. At one point, I'd say. Oh yeah, dangerous. I mean, Nobody I heard he had the you know, sparring too hard. But yeah, you know how I am. I, I like that. I like that. The spar hard. <laughs> you know, he, he's. I like I like Hector a lot. Yeah, yeah, he definitely had a rep of being one of these guys. One of the guys you would not want to fight. It's a shame. Did, it, did Hector ever fight in the UFC? I don't think he did. I, think I feel he like did. did he? I think he did. Maybe he did. He was one of those guys that was so powerful that he could beat anybody on any given day. Yeah, he had the knockout power, right? Where it was never a good fight to have. Yeah, he could knock out anyone on any day. Yeah, say. Hector yeah, he was a beast, man. Oh yeah, he, he used did. to train at a Matt Harris with uh, George Sotteropoulos. and I, I remember George telling me that he, you know, he didn't like. Uh, the way Hector used to spar too hard. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm surprised. Uh, yeah, he. My, I've just forgotten his whole UFC run. He had a huge UFC run. It's funny because I remember him as like the Bellator guy because I think he had that really crazy run in Bellator, right, where he was just 
winning all his fights. And then he came to the UFC. He's still fighting, huh? He's still active. He did, he did bare knuckle. Um, yeah, and he's got That's an right. upcoming bout against uh, Gamebred. So, fair play, man. Fair play. One of the real deals. Um, and then final two. Uh, <laughs> this guy's not a fighter. And I had to look him up. And I was like, who the hell is that guy? And then, of course, uh, so Dale Brown, who you're going to go, who's that? Who's the guy who you'll definitely have seen on the, he's on the memes and everything. He's that guy dressed up like a cop. I think he is a cop from Detroit. And he's the one that does all the like, oh, this submission would, this is how you get out the submission. And <laughs> you, you seen him? You got your phone. Oh, so, that you... Guy who, um, yeah, that guy who uh, has, he almost like he's part of Mac Dojo, yeah? Something like that. Yeah, if you <laughs> have a look. Uh, well, if that's the guy I'm thinking of, the only thing I can think of is uh, he's a joke, man. He's a joke. Total joke. Yeah. That guy. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that like that security guard guy that yeah, that's he gets true. himself killed every time showing these techniques of taking away a gun and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then final one, um, just to end it on, uh, Anth- Anthony Johnson. Wow. Gone too soon, man. Yo, mm. I know he used to raise bullies. He used to love par stones. He loved my bracelets. Um, the thing with Anthony Johnson that kind of trick, uh, kind of threw me a curveball. Um, I used to watch him fight when he was fighting and I always wanted him to fight John Jones. I always thought that he was a man who was, who would beat John Jones. And, you know, he had all these health issues. And I remember when I contacted him about um, making a bracelet for him. And he was like, at all, like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm talking to Anthony Noy. And I was like, oh, my God, you're Anthony Rumble Johnson, you know. <laughs> so that, that humbleness and that um, that respect he had for me, uh, I we always messaged each other. And I always thought, I, I can't wait to meet you. We always talked about to each other. We look forward to meeting you one day. And. Unfortunately, never got to meet him. So, yeah, damn. Gone too yeah. soon. Yeah, definitely. We talked about even having him on the podcast at one point. And, uh, yeah, I got a name yeah. for you. Okay. Steven Seagal. <laughs> I was never a fan of Steven Seagal thoughts? growing up. Were you? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I said I was never really a fan of his movies growing up. Were you? <laughs> Yeah, I actually did like his Under Siege. Oh, I used you? to like his. Uh, I used to like it, man. That's funny. But he's a. Uh, um, if you if you threw that name at me, a big fake, a big phony. We did last time. He like... needs to. Oh, we did. We do that. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to fucking rip him again. I just. I think he's a big pussy. Man. He's a big <laughs> pussy that just. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, is, that, is that what I said last time too? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I think you were more savage. But how oh, about some of the I other mean? ones? Well, what do you wait? If we're talking action heroes, how do you rank them? Like, if you were going to say who the best action, best actor, if you've got Jean Claude Van Damme, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Chuck Norris. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else? Who else? Bruce Lee. Yes. Where, where where do you rank them? Who's your who's your go to? Um, it's all like eighteen action heroes. I like Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan, good shout. Jackie Chan is good. Um, Alexander Fuxing. Who the hell is that? <laughs> you don't know Alexander Fuxing? Oh my god! <laughs> who the hell is Alexander Fuxing? What? Film did he do? Uh, he was on all the Chinese kung fu movies. I used, to, I used to love those when I was growing up. Oh, okay. Old school. They're Bruce all on fight was, path. Bruce Lee was one of those legends that, that um, in the movie, as far as movie actor, yeah, Bruce Lee was great. Yeah. Unreal. I, I, I great. do personally think Bruce Lee was a bit arrogant, but maybe he had reason to be arrogant. Uh, Chuck Norris maybe. was good. Uh, Jet Li is awesome. Jet Li was good. And even that guy who played uh, Bruce Lee, uh, Jason Jason Lee Scott, he was pretty damn good, man. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about Steven Seagal sucks? Oh, really? Oh, no, Steven Seagal. Oh, we, Sylvester Stallone, my bad. <laughs> oh, no, Sylvester Stallone. He's, he's awesome. I like Sylvester he's Stallone. Awesome. He's awesome. I love the rock. And films, uh, yeah. Van Damme, I, I used to like his stuff, man. I mean, Who? people people rip on him saying that he was fake and, you know. Oh, Van Damme. Van Damme, yeah. But yeah, oh, man, his Van flexibility Damme. and his, his uh, showmanship and the acting is... Second oh, to none, man. Definitely. I think I actually, got to, meet Van, I actually got to meet uh Van Damme. Van Damme? Really? How, I got how did that go? Hollywood. It's at a Planet Hollywood uh oh, yes. grand opening. I went there in Hawaii and he was there and I gotta take a picture with him. Nice. What was he like? Um not nice, not mean. Uh, he just was pretty much taking a picture with a fan. <laughs> Neutral. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Cool. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed that. These are always super fun, these episodes. So thanks to Josh for giving us the suggestions to do part three. I'm sure at some point there'll be a part four. But um, if anyone does have any suggestions for some future episodes, let us know. We're, we're coming up to episode 100. How scary is that? That's pretty crazy. Wow, that's awesome. And we yeah. still only can get 500 views. What the fuck? <laughs> Don't remind us. Um, but yeah, if anyone uh, has some ideas for episode 100, let us know. We were uh, we might I might have to start planning some stuff soon. But um, yeah, we'll speak to everyone again soon. And take care. Thanks for watching, everybody. Like, subscribe, and share, and give us any comments on what you want to see next. Right on.